let's say someone gives us quarterly travel costs. Okay, so let's say uh, to zero capital generation, I say that at a neutral sphere, there is some neutrino plus coming out. And someone gives me this class. Now I want to see what happens to these neutrinos as they travel around. One thing obviously we expect that there will be some level terminology. So let's see how to how to do it. Okay, so we're going to start in the core, density is of the order of 10 power 12 and 10 power 10 gas per cc. Then we are going to come to the surface of the star, the density is very small, let's say 0.1 gas per cc. Then you will travel to that core, you reach the earth. And it's possible that if a detector is here, then of course you see the neutrinos directly. If the detector is on the other side of the earth, the neutrinos will travel through the earth to the detector. Okay. And we know from solar neutrinos that when you travel through the earth, you will have again matter effects, like a daylight effect of solar neutrinos. So all these things will happen. Okay. And in addition, some, some other things. So we will see things in three steps. Inside a supernova, there are level conversions through what are called as collective effects. Okay. They, these are effects that you have never heard of till now in this class. Then there will be resonant matter effects. So just like the resonance inside the sun, image of the resonance is kept. Between the supernova and the earth, mass eigen states will travel independently. This you know because in sun there is the same thing, right? You come out, whatever happens happens inside the sun. Once you are out of the sun, you just travel independently to the earth, right? No fuel components. And this is also something we are familiar with, that if you pass inside the earth, then there are matter effects. Resonant, I say resonant because the Mixing angle changes. Actually, in the case of supernova neutrinos, it changes quite a lot. When you did daylight effects, your mixing angle changed by some t4 degrees, I guess. Less than that. In the case of supernova neutrinos, it can change by 10 degrees. So let's let's see what happens. I give you an idea of how to do things, go about doing things, and I will show the results. Okay, because calculating results is not easy. So what do we have? So inside the star, just outside the neutral of course you have very large densities. Now very large densities means what is the mixing angle? Now inside the sun, what happens? Large density is pi by two. So pi by two. So normally you would say mixing angle pi by two means no fewer terminology. Sin square two theta is zero. This is what people thought for many many years. Half of my school now people have been there. The reason is the following. Um, as was found out about five years ago, uh, at the neutral sphere, the neutral density itself is very high. Not just density of matter, but also density of neutrinos. So it is about ten power. 30, 10 power 32, uh, 32 neutrinos per centimeter. It's a uh, class number. Now, what happens is, although neutrons are very easily interacting, if we have densities of this order, 10 okay, power 32, 10 power 33, 34, yeah, per centimeter cube, then you have neutrino neutrino spectrum. So, for example, You can have interactions, then you have uh, me coming in, and uh, let's see, you coming in, that can go to this one. So we do a proper segment.
So this is what we did when we were in a simple model. So just the potential. This is potential to do is because the momentum of moving remains the same. However, the, you had a potential because of this interaction. Now what happens is you have a new coming in. You can track in a new view, for example. And now, from outside, you will see that a new came in with momentum t. So if this is like this is that box. Can you see that a new with momentum t came in, and a new with momentum t went out? So this is equivalent to a forward scattering due to other neutrinos. And if there are a lot of such neutrinos, then this becomes dominant. So as Large uh, neutrino densities. This is dominant. Okay, so therefore, even when you are deep inside the star, it's possible that the new e becomes new without having to have mixing angle to the planet. So this will not be any missing end, just a movie that we do. So this is called as the forward scattering due to new new interactions. So how do things change? So if you wanted to calculate the Hamiltonian, you would write the Hamiltonian in vacuum, which you not write up. It's n square by 2 e, it's 3 by 3 by 2. Then you have Hamiltonian for MSW effects, which has BC in one diagonal element and everything else here, which is this. So this is this is MSW diagonal. So BC, which is root two GF times AD, and diagonal of non zero means it's only at the minimum. This new effects give rise to slightly more complicated Hamiltonian. This is new new, new potential. So therefore, not that it depends on of course GF, then it depends on the density matrix of all neutrinos and density matrix of all activities. Okay. So here you have to talk in the language of density matrix, you can't talk in terms of states. Because all things are happening in an incoherent manner. But you don't have a single neutrino view. Each neutrino that is coming out is influenced by all the other neutrinos that come out from different regions of the star. So things are not exactly coherent. So you can't use Schrodinger's equation in the same way once. Okay. So whatever was done yesterday is very relevant for this. You can only use formula uh, the density. However, things are more crucial because see earlier on image of the effect, when you have a neutrinos, you forget about new part. You never had new part. The neutrinos, you just look at neutrinos. Mixing. If there are new bars, you consider new bars, not about new. These two are very, very distinct. Now you see that in the potential itself, in the Hamiltonian, you get density matrix for neutrinos and that for anti Both of them are. So things become complicated. First thing you are going to, how your neutrino propagates depends on what anti neutrinos are doing. That's one important. Second thing is now note that if I write down this uh, Eisenberg equation of your equation of density matrix, uh, d rho by dt, is R commuted along H and rho. But now H depends on rho because this H has this rho in a complicated rho. So what this means is that this equation is nonlinear. And if you are solving enough differential equations, you will know that when equations are non linear, it becomes difficult to solve. Linear differential equations, what you can at least hope to solve. But non linear are very complicated equations. Normally, you can solve them only in very, very specific cases. So it turns out that in the case of neutral propagation, things do happen in specific. There are specific special cases which can be applied. In some parts, we can solve. 
Simultaneously, what happens inside a super? Yeah, we will not be able to solve this equation okay, because uh, solving the equation is uh, is tough. I mean, Indraj tries to solve the first part of the equation for quite some time. Arko tries to solve the second part for hopefully not a very long time. <laughs> so yeah, things take things take a long. I just tell you some new phenomena that happen because of this. Yeah, I won't tell you how to apply it. So what happens now? It's when you come out of this neutral sphere. The first thing that happens is what is called as synchronized oscillations. Synchronized means the following. So this is just like the oscillation picture that we saw first for vacuum oscillations. Except in vacuum, what happens? Each energy oscillated with a different wavelength. Delta right? times square by two b. So every wavelength. Every frequency went back a different rate. Right? So we saw that uh, this P for one MeV will go uh, slowly, whereas P for you know, less than one MeV will go very fast. Here it so happens that neutrinos of all the energies recess with the same frequency. That's so why they are called synchronous. So in vacuum oscillations, the wavelength depends on energy. In synchronized oscillations, music doesn't depend on that. Everything has the same name. So, very special thing. It comes from the equations of motion, but I will not try to show you. So the equations are very different. It turns out that the solution is of simple oscillations. Okay, so, these are two important things. One is that mu and mu bar oscillate in the same frequency. And second is that this mixing angle is very, very small. So, this angle you are inside the matter, right? So, angle is almost pi by 2. So, which means theta is very small. So, even though these oscillations these happen, the change is very small. So, you start from the neutral sphere, you go for some time, and the change is so. So, this is your neutral sphere. For some time, you have got synchronized oscillations. This almost means both the version of the mixing is But once you come to a region where density of the is slightly smaller, it is decreasing, right? It goes as uh, it goes to this time. So then what happens is you change into a phase where you get what are called bipolar oscillations. So the precision now is combined with something that looks like mutation of a top. And when the top loses its momentum, it precesses, but once in a while it dips down. Okay. So this motion, as you will see, almost similar to this. So this is precession. So P wants to precess about this B. However, while precessing, once in a while, it has to dip down. So if you look at the probability of survival, you will see that on top of this oscillations, you will get these sharp dips. Very strange phenomenon, never seen before, but it actually happens this way. How this happens, exactly how you go from synchronized regime to the bipolar regime, is still an open question. This is this is a key point in the history. So what are the effects? Effects are firstly it looks like a mutating top, as I mentioned. Secondly, these are not simply oscillations of nu e going to nu mu. Whenever nu e goes to nu mu, the nu e bar also has to go to nu mu. So we show, saw earlier that in the depression equation, you had nu e and you had nu e bar. So they are coupled. Now nu e's cannot say that I don't care about nu e bar. So actually what happens is whenever a nu e goes to nu e bar, sorry, whenever a nu e goes to nu mu, a nu e bar has to go to nu mu. Coherent okay, Again, this is a very new phenomenon. Uh, we know what happens if this phenomenon takes place. We know this phenomenon takes place. However, we still don't know how you start by synchronized and how you go into this region. So that is still to be seen. What's important is that this happens. Even if theta must be very very small. So even 10 power minus 10. In fact, this is an underestimation. It happens even with theta must be of 10 power minus 50. 
it's, it's an unstable decision which, which always will be more problematic. This is important because of the following. In ILO, for example, okay, you will be able to see the difference between two hierarchies if theta on 3 is more than maybe 3 degrees, 4 degrees. If theta on 3 is smaller, you will not see a difference between normal and inverted hierarchies. So this, I guess some of you have heard of at some point. So for experiments that we do on work, all these long distance experiments, for them to distinguish between the mutual hierarchies, it's very crucial that theta on 3 is significant. Okay, not very small. So in fact, if you go to theta on 3 less than, let's say 10 power minus 2 or so, no black experiment can distinguish between two hierarchies. However, now you see that if you look at signal from a supernova, then you have effects even when theta on 3 is as small as 10 to minus 10, as I said, 10 to minus 15. So therefore, this becomes the effect which is very sensitive to mass hierarchies, but uh, it doesn't need very large theta. Okay. Yeah, so note that this effect, for example, this mutation happens only for one hierarchy. Okay. So simple supernova models. This happens only for inverted hierarchy. It doesn't happen for normal hierarchy. As a result, what you see on the Earth with the nuclear spectra will be different for a normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy. So this means that even for a very small theta on 3, you can differentiate between the two hierarchies. So this is where supernova neutrons win over the standard long distance. So this is not all, this is just the second stage. So what this does is this bipolar oscillations, so take you out of this position mode. Okay, so then you can have a large theoretical. What happens later on is something even more it's called a spectral state. So now what happens, see earlier what was happening, all the energies were processing with the same frequency. Okay, so all the peaks were the same. As you go in outer layers, what happens is uh, some of the energies start processing about Z axis. Remaining frequencies start processing about the minus z axis in the spectral state. So half the energies process like this. So half the uh, energies process like this about z axis. Half the energies, half the p value, the three power, and can process like this. Again, this is a strange phenomenon. Okay, we observe it numerically. We have analytic understanding of it in some cases, but not in all cases. Unsolved problem. So we know what happens. We don't understand why it happens. Okay, we know that there is some nonlinear differential equations. We know what it is. We can solve it numerically, and we get the answers. In specific cases, we know why the answers are available. Okay, but generally speaking, we don't have a solution. Okay, so this is an open question. So what is the effect? So let me tell you what the effect is. So, you know, if you rotate about Z axis, it is as if saying that there is no flavor convergence. Okay, so you all have this, this is another logic. Yeah, if this E, the mixing angle here was very, very small, then it presses about this axis, there is no flavor convergence. Probably your survival is equal to 1. If you invert and precious about this axis, this means probability of survival is zero. Because P survival is zero. So some energies precious about the Z axis, which means some energies don't convert at all. Some energies precious about this axis. It means those energies convert completely. So which means that for some energies, mu e and mu don't Interconvert at all. For the remaining energies, all mu is supposed to do mu, all mu is supposed to do mu. So, you can see in this plot. Okay. So, um, I have 
initial processor part is good. I'll show you what initial processor is. So start from here, go along this uh, black line, and come like this. This is initial UI. Initial UI was this one. Initial new view was this one. Now what has happened is below about 10 in it, new UI and new in new UI and new view success stay the same. Okay, so below 10 in it, red line is new X. So new X stayed new X and new E stayed new. So they couldn't believe that error. About 10 in it, all the new E's became new X. So suddenly new E spectrum becomes this. And all the new X became new E. So suddenly the new X spectrum suddenly becomes this. There is something called a split with energy, below which different things happen, above which different things happen. Okay. So these are these three new phenomena that happen in supernova nucleus, and they happen only in supernova. We don't know of uh, any other situation where they happen. Well, synchronized ones actually happen in uh, early universe, but so we had three new phenomena. Until now we looked at two phenomena. We had looked at vacuum oscillations and we knew about MSW resonances. Now we have three more things. One is what I call as synchronized oscillations, which means all mu and mu bar oscillate with the same frequency. Second thing is what I call as bipolar oscillations, or they are called pendular oscillations as other reasons, where you get coherent oscillations of mu e mu bar, mu e to mu and mu bar to mu. And third was spectral slip, or spectral swap, or spectral split, which means that nu e and nu x interchange completely, but only within certain energy ranges. And then this depends on various factors, initial spectrums. Also, nu e bar and nu x bar will interchange within certain energy ranges. Okay. So therefore, there is a lot of lot of rich physics. See, this is happening deep inside the star. So it affects many astrophysical things. For example, it will affect the nucleus in this is the heavy element. Okay. I mentioned before, perhaps, which, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this in class. Okay. In fact, that the neutrinos were used. There should be three neutrinos aligned for the first trend. Yeah, yeah, right. I should do something. So, for example, you want to create heavy elements. So heavy elements means elements with more number of neutrons. But if you have lots of new E's, you can't produce many neutrons because new E's combine with neutrons and make protons immediately. So somehow you want to suppress the number of new E's. So uh, level convergence means new E's will go to new E's, new E's will go to new E's. So we don't know which way it will affect, but it will affect definitely because spectra are very different. So it can affect the production of heavy elements okay? and it can affect shock wave propagation because now we want neutrinos to push the shock wave. Now, movies have higher cross section, so they can push the shock wave more efficiently. If all of them convert to new mu, this mu cannot push the shock wave efficiently. So, things get affected. So, all these, all these uh, things can be affected by these elements. So, therefore, it's important to understand what this current is. So, here now it is not so. So, this is what happens, right? an example that I gave earlier. So, uh, so these are initial spectra, UE and UE. So, red is electron neutrinos and blue is other neutrinos. Okay, so, red is UE and uh, blue is UE. And so, gray regions are the regions where you have what swaps. New and new okay, so now you see that even though initial spectra are nice and smooth, final spectra can have strange shapes. So this new e spectrum, for example, this red curve looks like this. Now it goes up, has a peak, comes down, another small peak, and then more. This also has two peaks. So if we are able to look at spectra that look like this, then we'll be able to say that we saw collective effects. And remember that this spectrum is for inverted hierarchy. This spectrum is a normal hierarchy. So, by looking at at what point you see peaks, at what point you do not see peaks, you will be able to figure out if the hierarchy is inverted or not. So, this is the point. The main main use for uh, 
le plus long en session de FedEx, le plus long, c'est le plus long en session de FedEx. Vous savez, c'est le plus long. Which happens at 1200 gas 
This is exactly like the sun rays. And it's always adiabatic. It's always adiabatic, it's always in neutral. Sun, because hierarchy is always normal, the resonance happens for neutrinos, not for anti Okay, We know that resonance can happen only in monopoly. Now, H resonance is strange because it depends on tetanus to atmosphere and we don't know the sign of tetanus to atmosphere. So, for one side, the resonance will happen in neutrinos, on the other side, it will happen in anti -neutrinos. So, now if you try to draw this diagram for n squares, you will see that for normal mass ordering, this H happens in neutrinos. For inverted, it happens in anti -neutrinos. So, again, finally, we are able to see some signal on the earth. So, if inverted and normal hierarchies give us different features, we will be able to separate it into two times. So, this is one more way that you can find out what the hierarchy is. Because the final spectra depends on what your hierarchy is. It also depends on the value of theta 1 3. Because, you know, we know that adiabaticity controls things. So, not only is the probability determined by the sign of delta x square, which is also determined by theta 1. So, it so happens that if sine square theta 1 3 is greater than 10 power minus 3, you have adiabatic things. And if this angle is less than 10 power minus 5, you have no adiabatic okay. So, what does this mean? This means if you see the signal, you can distinguish between sin square theta 1 3 up to order of 10 power minus 3 and 10 power minus 5. So, again this goes on to show that to determine theta 1 3 in supernova, you don't need to go to, you don't have to have theta 1 3 up to order of few degrees. You can have theta 1 3 up to order of 10 power minus 5 and you can still say something about that. So, that's the, that's the reason we see. So finally, fluxes arrive at the earth. So initial fluxes were, let's say, f0 to e and f0 to x. Then they'll be mixed. Okay, so what will happen at the earth is, you will get some p times f to e 0 and 1 minus p times f to x0. So there will be some mixture. Okay, so p is the survival probability of moving and then you get we get the earth is some fraction of UE and some other fraction of UX. Similarly, for UE bar, you will get some fraction of UE bar and some fraction of UX bar. And then you can go through, so you have to consider now simple resonance phase, bipolar phase, spectral split, H resonance, H resonance. After all this, you will get answer of probability of survival of UV and UV. So, capturing P and T bar is what's going through all these five steps. Okay. That's the reason we didn't try to capture everything. So, what happens finally? Okay. I don't want you to, to remember these values. Okay. Just, just look at the very uh, So, what in principle, what it can do is the following. See, this is P. So, probability of survival for UV. This is P bar. Probability of survival And then you will see that this actually depends on whether the hierarchy is normal or inverted. And if the mixing angle is large or small. Large is, large is this, small is this. So normally you would call this large, you still call this small. Supernova pardons, this is still called this large. So without going into details, the idea is that. Depending on what the hierarchy is, depending on what theta 1 3 is, you are able to see different signals in the final neutrino spectra. And your aim is to look at the final spectra and figure out something about neutrino mixing. Yeah. Or you can figure out something about the star. So now we go to detection. So how do we detect, what do we detect, and what do we want to detect? So till now, we have seen only one supernova in neutrinos. 
half a day or a day before the actual equilibrium. But because neutrinos start as soon as the collapse happens, whereas light starts when the shock wave reaches the outer limit. Okay, and that takes about, you know, depending on supernova, 6 hours, 12 hours, what is the equilibrium. So therefore, we first receive a burst of neutrinos. The question now is, once you receive the burst, you know that before tomorrow you will see something in the sky. Okay, hopefully, because supernova explodes. But you may see something in the sky. The question would be, can you tell where you will see the supernova in the sky? From where the events came? Of course, you will see a number of events. But if you are able to see where they came from, you can sort of move all your optical telescopes in that direction. You don't want to look around in the sky usually. You know that it's going to appear there. So the question is how well can you do this? So, see the major events are this. Uhi bar proton going to neutron plus positron. But these events are isotropic. See, Uhi bar has energy of 10 MeV. Okay, 10 MeV, 50 MeV. Proton has a mass of 1 GeV. So, big. So therefore, it is almost isotropic. So they are of no use. So if you only observe these events, you will not be able to say where the supernova. However, if you look at this nu e bar going to nu e bar event, this uh, electron elastic scattering event, electron is half a mm. So if a neutron is coming with energy of 50 mm, of 10 mm, the electron will most likely go in the forward direction. So these are the events that you want to see. Unfortunately, the isotropic events are 50 times the forward scattering events. Large background. If you look at this map of the sky. Yeah. So these events, so this is basically detector, okay? Detector, spherical detector. Uh, if supernova happens somewhere there, these blue dots that you see are like events of electron scattering. They will give direction if you project that. The green thing over here is the background. So the question is how to efficiently separate the background from the signal. And the answer is the following. Okay. So I didn't give it. Okay. If you did not, if you had no way of detecting background from the signal, you can detect the supernova within a cone of about 5 degrees. So without doing anything, just by you go fit, you go fit to a spherical distribution, isotropic plus a forward. You can do that and you can look at a supernova, you can say it's within that 5 degree circle in the sky. If you had some way of throwing away all these green dots, then you are sure that you will be able to things back much better. So, how does one do that? The trick for that, actually, no one talked about cardinal. Did you talk about cardinal? So, remember in the first experiment of uh, Nui, first observation of Nui, Anderson Co. 1, what did they do? They used this cadmium chloride. Okay. So, what cadmium did? Yeah. yeah. How did you do? Yeah. Uh, the activator came and produced the uh, positron. They gave uh, two photons in both direction. And then uh, after the microseconds, cadmium uh, gave it. Yeah. Right yeah. So this cadmium absorbed the neutron and after some time gave a specific wavelength. Okay. If this happens, then you are sure that the reaction produced a neutron, which means the reaction came from a nuclear. So if you can put such a salt inside the detector such that you can detect this neutron, then you can remove all the background because all these background events involve neutron. So if you see a neutron, you throw that data. And then you can uh, separate out only these neutron and neutron events. And then these 5 degrees will go down to about 2 degrees. Okay. You can actually really point to this point you want. So people are working on how to incorporate carolinium inside supercomputer finance. So there are many interesting issues in work. Another thing I wanted to mention is, just like our daylight effects, if the neutrinos pass through the earth before the computer detector, we will see earth oscillations. 
100 GeV, which means below 100 GeV, I still cannot detect the gene. Now I make a statement here. This says this is we detect superdominant neutrinos to highest precision. So what is this? What is this okay, called? There is a problem with that. Uh, not more than one detector was picking up the charity probability. So, but if you are looking at this luminosity, you do not need specific detector. Basically, you can do with a totally integrated count differential. So, normally what happens is neutrinos are like singly, they interact only singly. So, in one day, you get one electron. Therefore, if you want to detect it from the background, you need it to travel sufficiently to give a signal in at least two photons. So here what's happening is supernova burst happens inside the ice cube within about 10 seconds you will have about uh, uh, I forget the number but of the order of some 30 million hits 30 million neutron hits all of them won't be able to reach a photo view in fact 90 percent of them won't okay. so out of 30 million 90% won't reach the detector, but 3 million will. So we get 3 million photons, which is enough to give you a good So you won't be able to identify any individual neutrino, but you will be able to just take the photon count in all ice cube detectors, add them up, you will see that in some set of 10 second intervals, that the count has risen by about 3 million. The background is not that high. So, okay. so, in fact, using an SQ, you will be able to determine this uh, neutral luminosity so to, uh, to about 1% or so. Okay. Super Kamekande cannot do this. Because Super Kamekande will see 10,000 units, which is about 1%. So 10,000 10, plus minus 100. Yeah. So that's one percent this group can do much better. So this is 3 million years. So this was an aside. This is to show that the detector, even though built for some other purpose, can turn out to be useful for doing something completely So when S2 proposal was originally given, this part was not proven. This supernova detection by S2, the idea came maybe about 5-6 years after the So this happens.
normal here. Yeah. Okay. So that, that is the way. Look at this front shop. This radius is increasing with time. This way again. This is radius, right? This is time. So it's not going to go much further. Now, another caveat is what's called as a backward shop. This one. We seem to be going backward in time. That's a different phenomenon. That happens because you have a shop you're traveling, matter falls on it, and there is what's called a reverse shop. This reverse shock travels slightly backwards, but this is a forward shock. This is the one that we have. This will be the So it's gravity towards the world. Yeah, that is our force. And the tail force. And the tail force is why it's going up the tail. This one, no? That's because matter keeps on falling from top. So that actually creates what's called as a reverse shock. Okay. And that part actually moves out of this side. Oh, you mean even this part wise moves out of the That's because matter is being pushed in this direction. Okay, so maybe I have this one. Signal here. Yeah. So you see, I can give you some idea of this. So you see, this is number of events as a function of time. So what do you see? Without shock wave, we will see a signal that looks like this. Smooth chip, right? Just increase this. If you pass through a shock wave, you will get this dip. If you pass through both forward and reverse shock, you will get two dips. So you curve it like this. So by looking at number of events, you will be able to see whether you pass through forward shock, or through forward and reverse shock both, or we did not experience the shock. We did experience the shock means that we were already non identity so nothing matters. Now this is done at some energy, 40 AB for example. I can do this thing at 30 AB, 20 AB, 60 AB. Different energies means different densities of resonance. See, resonance density right See, for energy, Resonant density is given by resonant uh, density. So you want it delta n square by two e cos two theta is equal to root two g theta. Okay. So different energy would mean different <laughs> density. So when you look at shock signal at different energies. You are looking at what happens in the star at different densities. So I look at this picture and give you something. So for example, um, so this these shapes are shapes of shock wave, how the shock wave passes. Now this is number of events corresponding to 40 AB. Now 40 AB corresponds to resonant density of somewhere here, about 900 times per system, this horizontal line, which is called as row 40. So now, you see when the first day happens, it happens at about 4.5 seconds. So this tells you that at 4.5 seconds, Shock wave entered a region of 900 gas pieces. And then you see here that between about 4 and 5 seconds, the shock wave has entered 900 gas pieces. Uh, so, 4 seconds is this uh, blue, and 5 seconds is this magenta. Okay. So, you see that the shock wave has entered this row 40 region between 4 and 5. Second dip is obtained at some 7.5 seconds. So you see here, at 7.5 seconds, therefore, the forward shock wave has entered the region of 900 gas pieces. So what does this mean? It means that by observing this event rate, I told you that shock wave entered 900 gas per cc at 4.5 seconds first and then at 7.5 seconds. 
by observing 40 NEV, I told you about nitrogen gas masses. If I observe 20 NEV, I can tell you about ethanol gas masses. If I observe 30 NEV, I can tell you about 1200 gas masses. So by observing different energy when the peak arrives, when the peak arrives, I can tell you where the shock wave was at different times. So what we are doing essentially is looking at neutrinos and we are able to say that oh, at 4 seconds the shock wave is here, 5 seconds it is here, 6 seconds it is here and so on. So we are actually able to track the shock wave by looking at neutrinos. And remember that there is no other way you can do this. You can't do this with light because light cannot come out of such high density. The so only way to know about shock wave with this much accuracy is if you look at it. So that makes this very important also for understanding about shock wave problems. That was to be the only way that we can see how shock wave problems. So this is this was the answer to Indra's question. So if you see a shock wave, you can tell you you can say what a scenario was. So scenario A meant uh, last eight hours normal energy. So when we look at the shock wave effects, we can tell something about hierarchy, we can tell something about eight hours. So all this is a, it's a complicated mixture of initial conditions that finally lead you to this. So I'll just summarize what supernova influence can tell us. So firstly, it can tell you about neutrino massive this because as we saw many many times there are many ways by which you can determine the mass hierarchy and theta 1 3 yeah. many can identify mass order normal or normal even at very very small theta 1 3 even at 10 power minus 10 so this is what you can tell you about neutrino physics then about supernova astrophysics. So how do astrophysics like this? Okay. That's because firstly you can look at it many many hours before light arrives. So you can actually optically dispose you can dispose of the system. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned some time back, you can track the shock wave when it is still deep inside the star. So, which you cannot do with anything else. That's what we could do. So there is something called as inverse supernova neutrino problem. So what does the problem mean? Problem means that you observe neutrino spectrum. Now we know that if you have to calculate what happens finally, you have to see what happens in the synchronized regime, bipolar regime, spectral spread, H resonance, L resonance, shock wave, or the after going through all this, you will get some signal. And then you have to look at proper detectors to look at the signal. So, detector gives you some signal. We are not sure what initial spectra are so because people who simulate supernovas can't give us accurate spectra. So, our job is to look at the final spectra and invert all these steps. So, try to figure out what will happen in each of these steps. That will tell you finally what the initial supernova was, what the initial neutral spectra were, and where they converge. So that makes some of the summary of this. If you figure out about neutral mixing parameters, hierarchy, theta 1, t, if you figure out arbitrary neutral spectra, which are, as I said, not very well known, and then you figure out shock wave propagation. Otherwise, you will never be able to see. How much of it? So, yeah, so this essentially, yeah, doing supernova neutral means to essentially do everything that you did in this first half of this course. Inverse in between oscillations, matter effects, changing matter densities, uh, variability, spin precision. Uh, it turns out that. Also, involve classical mechanics and precision of talk and mutation. Yes, it's very, very 
physics H K. So then if you want to do that, you I don't know. Yeah, sometimes good people are good for you to once in a while at least see what what goes on. Stop here. Alpha's uh, talk is postponed to Thursday.